Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all gathered out this morning. It's a damp, miserable morning outside, but it's good to be here in the warmth and the heat of the church building and worshiping together uh, this Sunday morning. And should you be here in person, you are very, very welcome, but equally online if you're watching via our Facebook Live, our church app, listening later on on our CD ministry, or watching on YouTube, you are all very welcome indeed. And on your behalf this morning, I bid a very warm welcome to Amy Lennox from FM Transition. I've got that right, it's not Transmission. You're not from an FM radio, but Faith Mission. So it's good to have you with us, Amy, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to bring to us about your work and the missionary work that you're involved with. And thanks also to Rita, who will be leading this morning's PW service. Uh, I know Rita's slightly nervous because I've put her up in the pulpit, which will be grand. We, sh- we won't put the cameras too close on Rita this morning. Good to see you, Rita. Just by way uh, of an update regarding the uh, restrictions, uh, whilst there is in the public domain the easing of restrictions, which we all welcome, the only thing you'll notice different today is that we, are, we don't have to record names. So that track and trace system is now gone. You will still have to wear your mask until you enter the church until you're seated. You can remove your mask and then you only have to put your mask back on again whenever we're singing together. So we welcome those very minimal easing of restrictions. Just a couple of announcements regarding the forthcoming week. On Wednesday evening will be the midweek and prayer meeting in the church hall. We will try and meet in the smaller hall in the back room just for the benefit of those who maybe find the acoustics in the big room uh, just a bit too much, maybe uh, difficult to hear the speaker on occasions. But just to say that if the crowd and the numbers do increase, we will have to move into the big hall for the benefit of social distancing because COVID-19 is still around with us and we as a congregation and we as a church session have a duty of care to look after all of you who come uh, into our buildings and into Uh, all of our activities. On Thursday evening, GB will resume. Uh, That's the first face-to-face meeting for a while, so that's welcome news. So we wish GB well. We'll be thinking about the GB and the BB, both as they resume their face-to-face meetings this week. So keep an eye out on Facebook or through our church app regarding uh, those various meetings and meeting times. Next week will uh, be the speaker will be the Reverend Colin Harris, our convener, and the prayer meeting will be in the church hall at uh, 11 o'clock. Also, on your behalf this morning, we bid a very warm welcome to Stephanie and Jenny Park. We're glad to have you with us. Stephanie and Jenny, we're looking forward to hearing you uh, bring uh, praise and worship to us, uh, and we extend that invitation and welcome to both the Park and Truesdale families as they join with us here as part of our PW service. You're all very, very welcome. These are all my announcements. I hope I haven't left anything out. And I'll now hand over to Rita, who will lead us in the remaining part of our annual PW service. I was hoping to do it from down there. (laughs) Good morning and welcome to our PW service. It's nice to see so many with us this morning. I was beginning to think, to think with the snow and storm units and none of us are going to get out this weekend. But it's lovely to see you all. PW, like any other organisation, has had to adjust to the changes caused by COVID. So we need to give thanks to Anne and Myrtle and the committee for putting their time and effort into planning programs which has allowed us a few face-to-face meetings and also uh, this morning we'd like to say thank you to Andrea for playing for us. As you all know, the aim of PW is to support local and global mission. We do this by various uh, fundraising events. Our sale, which would have been the main event for us, sadly has had to be put on hold as well. Um, We have home mission boxes Um, given to members or anybody else that would be willing to take them. We also give a big thank you to the congregation who usually give very generously to the work of our PW. Our mission boxes and leprosy boxes 
are usually counted by committee. But again, because of COVID, uh, we are not allowed to do that. So if you can count your own box and put the donation in the basket provided in the vestibule, or you can donate by bank transfer, and uh, information relating to that is also in the vestibule. If these options are not possible, just leave your box in the vestibule. <laughs> I'm hoping that's all clear. If it's not, just ask Anne. <laughs> that was just a general information to let you know PW, like all other groups, are working away to achieve our aim, which is to encourage women of all ages and stages in life to grow in their faith and to walk side by side albeit after this past two years, it's been from a social distance. We haven't been side by side at all, too, sure, haven't girls? <laughs> With us this morning, and not from a distance, but has come a distance, is Amy Lennox from Faith Mission Transition. Amy, you're very welcome, and we look forward to hearing from you later on in the service. We also have... Stephanie and Jamie with us this year. And I think last year we heard you think, singing through Zoom, did we? Yeah. So it would be great to, have, to hear you in person this year. As I have said, the virus has caused changes in church, church life and in our daily lives. Change isn't always comfortable. And we can feel confused and anxious and lost or to coin a quite a modern phrase, our heads can be all over the place. Our faith can be smothered by all that's happening around us. But we read in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we seek to still our hearts and minds in your presence, we give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ. There was no other good enough to pay the price of our sins, he only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Lord, as we journey through all the changing scenes of our lives, we ask that you will be our guide. We confess we are prone to wander like lost sheep. We sin in thought, word, and deed. And our feelings and thoughts can smother our faith. Teach us to keep our focus on you, because you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. Your love never changes. Your grace is unchanging through all the changing things of our lives. Your promise is to never leave us nor forsake us. We ask now, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will move amongst us. And we, like Samuel, will be able to say, Speak, Lord, thy servant here. Be with Amy as she shares with us, with us later. And now may the, word of, the words of our praise and the med meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Our first item of praise is Bind Us Together, after which Julie Wilson will bring our first Bible reading from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. Bind Us Together.
Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. And God, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. Amen. Thank you, Julie. Now, mother and daughter, Stephanie and Jenny are going to come to sing for us. I think you're singing two pieces. Thank you. 
up and overflow, my song resound forever, for grace will see me welcomed home, to walk beside my Savior, by grace I Thank you very much, Jenny. That was brilliant. Did you sing happy birthday to Ben yesterday? <laughs> Thanks, Steph. Um, did you see where we are now, Jan? <laughs> um, Amy's going to come now and do the children's address for us. And afterwards, then the children leave for Children's Church. Good morning, everybody. It's really good to be with you all. Thank you so much for having me along. And good morning to all the boys and girls. Put your hands up if you count yourself in the boys and girls. Yeah, I see a few of you. Good to see you all. I'm at the wrong side of the church. Oh, there's one down there. Hello, darling. It's so good to have you all here today. And uh, I want to tell you something very special. I remember whenever I was a wee girl, um, I used to come to church and I used to sit there, and I used to eat polo mints. And um, there was wee rungs round all the gallery, and I used to sit and count how many wee rungs was round the gallery um, boards, because I didn't really think that church was a place for young people. I thought I was too young to be at church. I didn't think I could really do anything that added any value to church. And I want to tell you something very special, and it's something that God told a man a long, long time ago who said to God the same thing. It was a man called Jeremiah. Hands up if you know anybody in your class at school called Jeremiah. Nope. There was a man called Jeremiah who lived in a long time ago, and God was asking him to do something very important. He was asking him to go and tell people a special message that he had just for them. And Jeremiah said, I can't do that, God. I'm too young. I am just a boy. I can't go and tell people the message that you have for them because I am too young. And we've already heard a verse about our enemy, the devil. And the devil would love to make you think that you're too young. He would love to make you think that you can't bring any value to this church. And I want to tell you what God told Jeremiah. God said to Jeremiah, let no one look down on you because you are young. Let no one look down on you. Let no one put you down because you're young. Let no one make you feel like you don't have a voice, like you don't have value, like you don't have a special plan to bring to this church because you're young. Because I have chosen you. And I want you to remember that today. God has chosen you even though you're young. You have a very special plan and a very special purpose that God has just for you. And I also remember when I was a little girl at church, I would look at other little boys and girls, like Jenny, who sang so beautifully there. It was a gorgeous um, few pieces of song. And I would look at the likes of Jenny up at the front singing, and I would think, I can't do that. I'd be too scared. In fact, even when I was a grown-up and God asked me to go into Bible college, I said, I was too scared. I said, I can't stand at the front and talk to people. I'm too scared. God, I can't do that. And I have two very special things in this bag. Who can tell me what special day it was this week? Yes. Valentine's Day, that's right. It was Valentine's Day. Now, I know some daddies here bought mummies some flowers for Valentine's Day. Hands up if you bought any flowers. 
That's a shameful lack of flowers in this church. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something. Neither of these flowers came from my husband either. These came from a friend of ours. My eldest daughter, Hannah, had a wee friend around to play on Friday, and these are the only flowers I have in my house because my friend bought me them when she was dropping her off. But I have. Who can tell me what this flower here is? Yes. A daffodil. Good girl. That's a daffodil. And it's yellow, and it has a big head, and it has lots of petals, and it looks a bit like a trumpet, doesn't it? Then I have this flower. Who can tell me what this is? It's not the normal color that you get. Yes, a rose. Good girl. This is a rose, and it stands big and tall, and it has lots of different petals, and it comes in lots of different colors. So I have a daffodil, and I have a rose. They're both flowers, but they both look very different. They both smell very different. They both have very different things about them. But I think that they're both beautiful. And I think that they both bring different things to my house. Different colours, different smells, different flowers. But they're both flowers. And I want you to know that you might look different. You might sound different. You might be able to do different things. But God made you you for a reason. And he doesn't want you to be like the person beside you. Because he made you with different skills and with different talents and able to do different things and sound different ways for a reason. Because he wants you to reach people in your world with all the different gifts and skills and talents that he has given to you. So I want you to remember that just because you don't look like someone else or sound like someone else or can do something that someone else can do, that doesn't make you any less special. Because God made you exactly how he wants you to be. For a reason. For the very special plan that he has in mind for you. So will you remember those things? Remember that you're never too young to do something for God. Because God can use you no matter what age you are. God can use you. And it doesn't matter if you don't look like the person next to you. Or can do the things the person next to you can do. Because God still has a plan for you. And he made you just the way you are for a very special reason. But you have to give your life to him. When you're young, it's the best time. I didn't give my life to God until I was 22. And I missed out on all those years that God could have used me. Give your life to God when you're young and see the very special plan that he has for you. Thank you so much for listening. You all listened so well. And now we're going to sing your song, which is Colours of Day. And then you can go out to Kids Church. Thank you so much.
very much, Jimmy. Jennifer Harbison will now bring our second Bible reading from 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7, followed by Rachel uh, Hellington, which will do the prayer of intercession. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, Your maidservant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels of all your neighbours, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door upon yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door upon herself and her son. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Amen. Let us come before God now in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for all the committed hard work and dedication that takes place within the organisation of PW right across the Presbytery in Ireland. We pray for each lady that so faithfully and loyally devotes their time for your glory. We think about the PW motto, women growing together side by side from a distance, and for the desire PW has to encourage women of all ages to become Christians and disciples of Jesus. As we continue to experience everyday reality and church life very differently from all we are used to, we look to God to give us necessary grace and peace for this season. More than ever, we need to live out the PW theme of side by side, albeit from the social distance required to maintain public health. This creates all sorts of new challenges for PW groups and as an organisation. For now, our focus is on being side by side in prayer and care for one another and living for Jesus as we love God with our heart, soul, mind, strength and our neighbour as ourselves. Within our home congregation, we pray for Church House, our elders, Kirk Session, as we seek to find a minister during this time of vacancy. We pray for each member and committee member of PW with acknowledgement of the enthusiasm, effort and energy that each person brings forward. We pray for each lady who brings forth their talents, gifts and ideas, which makes our PW the warm, caring and supportive environment that has established. From the ladies who organise the programme of monthly events to those who provide and cater for the supper afterwards. We pray that you will richly bless each one of them as they seek to be a blessing in their homes, our community and our church. We pray that we may not be discouraged by postponed and cancelled meetings due to COVID in our local area. We thank you for the people and organisations that PW support. We realise that through their work, they are seeking to work alongside each other side by side during the pandemic. For our missionaries overseas, we pray for their safety and message to reach nations far and wide. For people who have not yet heard or had the privilege of hearing your word, that your gospel may fall on listening ears and open hearts. In times when these missionaries may feel discouraged, far from home, or face constant threats and battles, we pray that you enlighten them in your grace and fill them full of your spirit. As it's written in 2 Corinthians 8, 11 to 15, at the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Let this message to us as we pray for the special home project that supports the work of different organizations as they serve people with addictions, offending behavior, and who require support housing. We pray for Thompson House, Carlisle House and Grey's Court. 
we thank you that funds raised by PW will be used to supply each of these houses with resources to run Christianity Explored courses for residents. We pray that through the work of these different places, people will recognise the need to have their spiritual relationship with God restored. May your word encourage us to support these groups financially and prayerfully. We pray too for the Special Overseas Project, which will support the translation into Arabic of a devotional book to help young Christian girls grow daily in their relationship and walk with God. We pray for the staff at a Christian publishing house in Beirut, dedicated to helping Arab women find their peace in God amidst everyday life challenges. We ask that this book will encourage and equip girls to live for Jesus in a very difficult environment and that the resources funded by PW will enable Christian women to fulfil their God-given roles and grow in faith, ministry and testimony to the non-Christian women around them. We pray for the ongoing work of the PCI deaconesses as they seek to help their congregations reach out to the unchurched in their neighbourhood by taking the gospel into the community and making it relevant to people's everyday lives. We ask that you will use the deaconesses to be a great support and encouragement to those they minister with as part of church work. We thank you for the work of the deaconesses in hospitals, hospices and prisons. We pray that each of the deaconesses will have a renewed passion for their role in evangelism and pastoral care as they offer practical Christian love and friendship to many people that they come into contact with. Lord, we pray for the ongoing spread of coronavirus. We ask for wisdom for all of the health organisations, doctors, nurses who are struggling to cope with this situation throughout the world. We pray for those we know and don't know who have lost loved ones as a result of COVID-19. Lastly, we pray for our speaker today, Amy Lennox, that you will bless her in her message and preachings as she ministers to us today and educates us on the work of AFM Transition that you will open our ears and move our hearts to respond to your word. Let what is shared today help each and every one of us stand side by side in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. In all this we pray, in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Rachel. And we now invite Amy up to the pulpit. Thank you very much, Rita. Rita told me before we came up here that she wasn't very good at this sort of thing, but I think she did a great job, didn't she? Thank you, Rita, for leading us so well. And thank you for having me along. Um, It's so good to be here with you. The road down was terrible. The floods are shocking today, but um, we made it here anyway, and thank you for having me along. As you've heard, my name's Amy. Um, I come from Castle Dawson, so it's just near Macrofelp, and uh, my husband Johnny is born and bred there, and you will not shift him no matter what you do. <laughs> um, he loves Castle Dawson. It was practically in our wedding vows that we had to move to Castle Dawson whenever we got married. So um, we're there. We've been married for eight years, and we have two children. Hannah is um, going to be four in May, and Emily is going to be two in May, so our house is chaos. Um, but we are having a great time and thankfully everyone is healthy and we can um, thank God for keeping us all healthy and safe over the past two years. Can't we? He's been very faithful to us all. Johnny and myself work full time with the Faith Mission. We both went um, to the Faith Mission Bible College in 2008 and worked, um, studied there for two years and then we both left the Faith Mission for a while to um, persevere with other forms of ministry. I ended up working for a homeless charity in Edinburgh for um, a year and a half after I left Bible college. But slowly we felt God calling us back in. I didn't become a Christian until I was 22. As I said, Johnny was uh, 18 whenever he became a Christian. And around the 13, 14-year-old age mark, both of us made a decision to 
turn away from everything that we had been taught by our parents and to go a different way. And so we both have quite a, a strong passion for that age bracket. We know that that's an uh, age where many young people make a decision whether they're going to stay with God or go their own way. And so we decided to approach the faith mission with an idea that we had um, for a new ministry to work specifically with the 16 to 30 age bracket. In that age, you go through a lot of different transitions in life. You go from GCSE to A-level. A-level, you can go to uni or straight to work. Um, uni, you go into work after that. You have relationships with other people. You have relationships with friends. Um, and we worked with a couple who even went through a period of illness um, and just needed someone to stand with them. And we wanted to be the people who can come alongside those young people, not to keep their eyes on us, but to help them focus on the one who can help them through each transition. Each transition in life is an um, area that either they can look to God or blame God and turn away from him. And so we wanted to help them keep their eyes on Jesus and walk with them through that. So we do it through three different ways. We do it through meetings, which is where we get together in churches. That was very much pushed um, to the side over the past two years, but we're starting to get up and running again, thankfully. Isn't it great to be meeting together again? It's great that Zoom um, just wasn't the same. It had its purpose, but it just wasn't the same. Sure it wasn't. And so it's great to be able to get out um, in person again to different churches, CUs and universities, SUs and schools, um, youth groups, wherever we will be asked to go, we will go to spread the gospel of Jesus. We also use a lot of media. Thankfully, we were using media before COVID hit. So um, Johnny was already pretty clued in. He had already a setup going that we could go to straight away. And um, we do a lot of online work through Facebook Live. And we ran two camps and two youth weekends online on Facebook. We didn't know how they were going to go, and we got great feedback from both, that the young people really enjoyed them, even though they were sitting in their own homes. We tried to keep it that you went and did things all day, um, like you would at camp. We had a morning devotional with them live, and then we had activities for them to do through the day, challenges, and then we came back for a meeting together at night time and small groups after that. We even managed to run a movie night for them, one of the nights on Zoom where we all sat watching a movie together. And we had a great time at those. And um, we really felt like God helped us and blessed those online we uh, youth weekends and camps. If you can keep in mind um, the camps this summer, we're hoping to start back again this summer in in-person camps. And it's been two years when we ran an in-person camp, so we're not totally sure how they're going to look. We're not totally sure how many young people are going to come along. Um, even our leaders have moved on and um, got into other forms of ministry, so some of our leaders aren't available to us anymore. So please pray for those camps as they go ahead. We'll be running the teenage camp at the end of July for 14 plus. Um, we're the only uh, teenage camp in the North Ireland run by the Faith Mission, so we'll hopefully be getting a good crowd of teenagers. And it's a really good opportunity to get them away from their um, family life, away from their normal life, and just to have them focus on God for five days. And uh, we would get very excited at Teens Camp for what God's going to do. So if you could remember us in prayer, that would be amazing. And we also do a lot of mentoring where we meet up one-to-one -one with young people. Um, there was one girl in particular I remember um, just meeting up one-on-one -on -one with. She was a straight-A student. She had... Um, no problem at school, and she was going on to be a lawyer. Her first year of uni, uh, epilepsy hit. She never had epilepsy before, and I remember going into the hospital to visit her, and she couldn't even play a game of snakes and ladders. She couldn't work out how to move the, the coin forward and backwards or up and down. She couldn't work out what way it was meant to go, and she was completely at the end of herself. She, the seizures wouldn't stop. She couldn't work out how she was going to do life like this. And uh, we kept in touch with her right throughout her illness. We went in a few times. Her mum um, didn't really get much of a break. So when we were there, she was able to get down to the canteen or get home for an hour or two and see the other children. And uh, we stayed with that girl and we prayed with her and we um, taught her what the Bible said when she couldn't read it for herself. And she's now fully qualified as a lawyer and working away. And she, her faith is as strong as ever. And we're so thankful to God for pulling her through that. 
and we're so thankful that we could be part of her journey. So that's a wee bit about what we do. Thank you so much if you've been praying for us and the faith mission as a whole over the past two years. It's definitely looked a lot different than what we were used to and uh, we're excited to see where God's going to take us now in the future. So I just want to turn for a few minutes to this woman in 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to focus on this lady in the Bible who positioned herself in such a way that God was able to do a miracle through her. A woman who invited someone into her world to walk side by side with her and it was the right person because she knew her God and she knew what God could do. This woman was wise. She was wise with who she allowed into her problems. She was wise with who she knew to turn to. Sometimes when we're facing problems, we go everywhere but to God, don't we? We put it on Facebook that we're having a rough time. We're putting it out on WhatsApp groups that we're having a rough time. We talk to our friends and our neighbours that we're having a rough time, but we don't always go to God. And over the past two years, I'm sure many of us have faced times of crisis that we just don't know who to turn to at the end of the day. And I think we can learn a lot from this wise woman about how she handled times of crisis in her life. I remember um, just last week, last Thursday morning, I got our youngest daughter up out of bed. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. She just woke up and I brought her downstairs and she was gasping and the tips of her fingers were turning blue proper gasping for air. She's normally a wee chatterbox and she couldn't get a word out because she couldn't breathe properly. That whole night had been a rough night. She had been up with croup cough, um, but I knew that this was something more serious than just a wee croup cough. And so I phoned um, the hospital and they said to bring her straight in. And the doctor on arrival told me if I'd waited two more hours, she would have needed a ventilator. Her oxygen levels were that low. I remember that moment I was in a time of crisis and I could either text everybody in my phone book and tell them what was going on or I could pray to the person who knew what was going on and knew how to help me. And this woman did just that. She knew what was going on and she knew who could help her. I'm just going to read the passage again. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. But the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do to, for you? Tell me what you have in your house. And she said, Your servant has nothing except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside. Borrow vessels from all your neighbours, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him, shut the door behind herself and her sons, and as she poured, into the, they brought the vessels into her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. What an amazing story. (laughs) History would tell us that this wife, that this widow, was actually the wife of Obadiah. Do you know the, the Bible book, Obadiah, the prophet? This was his widow. And if you just look back in chapter 3, you'll see that a mighty battle was fought whenever they rebelled, Moab rebelled against Israel. And it's thought that her husband, Obadiah, was killed in that battle. And this is why this story is placed here in Second Kings. But something more, if you look back through history and through the Bible, you'll see that Obadiah and his wife actually hid 100 prophets from the evil king who was trying to kill all the prophets of Israel. They actually hid them together. And it's thought then that this woman is in debt because they were hiding these prophets and they had given all that they had to look after them. They had fed them and they had got water for them and they had got shelter for them. And everything that they had had been put into hiding these men of God from the evil king. And then her husband was killed in battle. And she was left 
with this enormous debt that Obadiah and herself had racked up from doing what God had wanted them to do. Isn't that sometimes how life feels like with us? We can do everything right. You can come to church, you can come to the PW, you can go to the church prayer meeting. You're doing everything right. You're doing everything the way God wants you to do it. You have everything right in your life and then a crisis hits and you feel like it's wrong and unfair for you because you've done everything right in your world. You feel like God has turned against you because no matter what you've done, crisis has still hit. And sometimes we can wallow in self-pity and blame God and we can look at God and say, this isn't fair, I don't understand. It's natural and it's easy for us to do that. But this widow saw a miracle happen in her world because she went to the right person and because she decided she wasn't going to stay sitting in self-pity, because she decided that she wasn't going to blame God, but she was going to go to God for help through this crisis. Are you facing a crisis at the moment that you need help with? Are you praying and praying and God doesn't seem to be answering? Maybe nobody has seen the tears that you've cried in the night, crying out to God for help in the situation that you're facing. And you come to church and you look okay, but nobody actually knows how many prayers you have cried out over these past few weeks, begging God to help you. This woman positioned herself correctly, and maybe you need to position yourself correctly. Maybe if you follow those three circumstances in your world today, you might find an answer coming your way. This woman has no name. She's seven verses in the Bible. And yet God did something amazing through her. And we know that it was an amazing miracle because at the end of the passage, Elisha says, you and your sons can live on the rest of the oil that was poured. So we know there must have been an awesome amount of oil poured because she can live for the rest of her days on the amount that God gave her. This woman had an extraordinary life. An extraordinary miracle happened to her because she followed these three circumstances in her life. The first one is brave obedience. Brave obedience. Obedience isn't really a word that we like. Um, it, it makes us think that we have to follow someone else. It makes us think we have to follow someone's rules. I am a bit of a rebel at heart. I always have been. And uh, I remember at Bible college being given all these rules. I was in the principal's office more times and they had these brass knobs all throughout the Bible college and I had to polish them more times than a little because I didn't follow the rules because I struggle to obey and I, it's something that God has been working on in me. Some of us struggle to obey and some of us struggle with obedience. We think it's to spoil our happiness. We think that it's to ruin our fun. We think it's to put a cramp on our style. And obedience can leave you vulnerable to other people. Telling people that God has told you something. How many times have you said to people that God has told you to do this? God has given you this word. God has given you this vision of what to do. And they tell you not to because it seems so extraordinary. What if brave obedience is the key to God answering your situation? Elisha here does not say, go into your house and shut the door and pour the oil into your vessels. Elisha says, go into your house, shut the door, and go, but first go around the whole of your neighborhood and tell them your situation and borrow their vessels. What a thing to ask. Could you imagine this afternoon you're sitting in front of the fire after your Sunday dinner and there's a knock comes at the door and it's somebody saying, I need to borrow all your pots and pans because God has told me to borrow them because I am clean broke and he's going to provide for me. Could you imagine going around your neighborhood exclaiming to everybody that you're broke, that you're desperate, that you're at the end of yourself? And God will provide for you, but I need to borrow your jar. This woman had brave obedience. This woman didn't care what people thought of her. They didn't, she didn't care what people were going to say about her. She didn't even seem to care if it didn't work. 
if she had to go back and hand all the jars empty back again. Because times of crisis can help us have brave obedience. This woman went and borrowed all the jars that she could and brought them home. Obedience might leave us feeling a bit vulnerable before people. It might have us going and saying, I heard God say this and I'm going to follow it through no matter what you think. I used to be a nurse before I went into the faith mission. I loved nursing. Nursing was one of my passions. Um, I drove my mum to distraction because every doll I got as a child was operated on or bandaged up or most of them died. But I, I loved nursing and nursing was always my passion in life. And I remember God telling me to leave nursing to go to Bible college. And I didn't really want to do that because I wanted to be an oncology nurse specialist. That was the the plan I had for my life. But God told me to leave it. And after a lot of to and fro between me and God, I decided that his way was best and I was going to leave nursing. But I had one final bargain to make with God. And I said, I'll go to Bible college for two years. I'll take a career break from nursing and then I can go back into nursing after Bible college and I can reach so many people for you when I'm working as a nurse in the hospital. And I said, if that's what you want me to do, you're to give me a career break when I go and talk to my boss. And if I can't get a career break and have to quit fully, I'll know that that's you saying I'm never to return to nursing again. And so I went into my boss and I put the ultimatum to her and I said, I can take a career break or I can quit And she said, there's someone already on a career break and we can only offer one at a time. You're going to have to quit. And I took that as a sign from God for my life that I was to leave nursing fully and give my life entirely to serve in him. And I went to Bible college and I studied for two years and then I came back and I didn't really have a solid plan of what God wanted me to do and I was struggling a wee bit with where I was meant to be serving now. And so many People, so many well-meaning Christians said to me, go back to nursing. You're meant, God wouldn't ask you to leave nursing. This is silly. You need to go back and do what God wants you to do. But I had had a word from God of what I was to do. And I had to be brave. Even though to everybody else it looked crazy, me leaving nursing and me leaving my degree and me not following through. Even though I knew to so many people it didn't seem right and it didn't seem like what God would ask you to do, I had to be brave and obey what God had told me. And because I was, I have seen people come to know Jesus who would never have got to know him. I have seen people follow Jesus. I've seen young people go to be a missionary in France. I've seen young people stay on track, not because of me, but because I obeyed and God was able to work through me. Obedience requires bravery. Maybe today you need to do something that seems illogical to everybody else, but you know it's what God is asking you to do. It can maybe be something as simple as going and inviting your neighbor to church. You know God's been putting them on your heart for a long time, but it's vulnerable to do that. Maybe today could be your day to do it. Brave obedience can be the answer to God starting to work a miracle in your world. This woman walked side by side with Elisha in her life, and when he pushed her to be brave, she saw a miracle work in her world. Brave obedience, then there's brilliant privacy. Brilliant privacy. I don't really understand how God works all the time. And I don't really understand why he chooses to work in the way that he chooses sometimes. In my mind, this story would have brought him much more glory and would have made it much more public if she had gone to the town square after she collected the vessels and started to pour the oil. And the whole of the town could see God working a miracle through her. But Elisha doesn't tell her to do that. Elisha says, go in and shut the door. Go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons just and start to pour the oil. Sometimes we don't understand why God works in the way that he does. And I am sure the widow's hands were trembling as she lifted her wee jar of oil and put the first vessel in front of her and started to pour Can you imagine the desperation that she's in? 
She's under so much debt that her sons are about to be taken away from her to be sold as slaves. This is her last hope. This is her last chance to keep her family together after having lost her husband. I'm sure if you're a parent in here today, you can imagine the desperation that she's feeling at this point. I can just imagine her hands trembling, but I can just imagine the worship that starts to pour from her lips as the oil keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. And she has to get another vessel and another vessel and another vessel because it doesn't stop. Could you imagine the joy that she exclaims because the miracle is happening. It's working just as the prophet had said. Actually, the prophet never told her what would happen. He just said, borrow empty vessels and start to pour. Imagine the worship that came from her. Privacy between you and God can be awesome when God works a miracle in your life. Whether it's the beginning of a relationship with him, maybe you've never had a relationship with him before, maybe you've never given your life to him, that is the very first miracle that happens in your spiritual life with God, is the fact that God can take us from death to life. What a miracle. And that is just between you and God often. That is just a moment that's just you and him. I don't know if you can remember that day. I remember the time I became a Christian and I remember the sobs and the praise that came from my mouth just between me and him. Maybe it's in a place of desperation and you have seen God do something in your circumstance and it was in a moment where it was just you and him in the room. Often this world is hard to get peace in, isn't it? And hard to shut the door on. I normally do my daily devotionals with Peppa Pig playing in the background because it's too hard in my house to get a minute where it's, there's nobody else but me. It can be so hard to shut the door on our work, to shut the door on all the worries that we have in life, to close the door on our financial bank statements that keep coming in that just don't look great, to close the door on all the noise that's out there, all the news headlines that's coming in, all the desperate stories that we hear every day, it can be hard to close all of those out so that it's just you and God. And oftentimes, it's in those moments where it's just you and him that you hear the most beautiful moments from God. Often it's in those moments that God does his biggest work in your life. And the brilliant privacy that when it's just you and him and no one else. Don't miss out on the miracle in your world because you don't shut the door on the world. Sometimes leaving our phone alone for 10 minutes is hard enough, never mind anything else. Begin to pick up your Bible. Begin to read what God says for yourself. Don't leave it from Sunday to Sunday to have someone who's standing up here to tell you what God's word says. Start to read it for yourself. Start to get God's promises for your own life in the privacy when it's just you and him. That's when you can hear God the clearest. Bold obedience. This widow showed bold obedience by going around everyone and making herself vulnerable. Brilliant privacy. She went into her house and shut the door and a miracle was worked just between her and God, just down there, no one else. And then we have bold expectancy. Elisha told the widow to borrow vessels and not too few. He put the responsibility on the widow (laughs) to do the work. He put the expectancy on the widow. How much faith do you have to see what God's going to do? We often create... um, We often wave what God has told us. We often create space in our life for God to work. But our faith levels can be so low that we don't see an answer straight away. We don't hear God's voice very clearly because our faith is so low in life. And our expectancy in what God can do with us is so low. Some of us need to be reminded today, like I reminded the children, that we are of value to God. And God has a purpose for us. 
And God can use you no matter what you feel like, no matter what you think you can bring to the table. God has a plan for you and he can use you in his purpose. Are you believing that what God has promised you will happen? Or are you doubting I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but think to yourself, on a scale of 1 to 10, where is your faith at? If 10 was that you believe God for anything and faith can move the mountain, that's number 10. Or 1 is, I really don't think God is even real. Where is your faith level? Where is your expectancy level? Is your faith weaker than it was this time last year? Have you maybe abandoned reading your Bible and so that is one of the reasons why your faith is weaker? Have you maybe lost that promise? Or maybe God gave you a promise years and years and years ago and you still haven't seen it come to pass. You're still struggling with expecting God to come through for you. Just before um, I got pregnant with our daughter Hannah, I was pregnant with our first baby. And God had actually promised me, 2 Kings 4 is a very special passage to me because God promised me in 2 Kings 4 that I was going to have a baby in the spring way before I ever got pregnant. And so I got pregnant um, and I thought, the baby's due in spring. This is God's promise to me. Isn't God amazing? God is going to be faithful to me. And I ended up losing that baby through miscarriage. And I remember thinking to myself, what happened? <laughs> God promised me, and God didn't come through for me. Did I hear God wrong? What is God doing? I don't understand. And how many times in times of crisis do we think, what is God doing? I don't understand. Maybe God gave you a promise years and years ago about your family or about your finance or about your life, and you just don't understand what God is currently doing because the promise does not seem to be coming through. And in fact, you feel like it's nearly died because you have so little faith left in it, because the circumstances look so bad that you can't see a way that he could possibly come through for you. I remember um, a week after I had the miscarriage, we were actually speaking at a teens camp. We were teaching at a teens camp the very next day after I had lost the baby, so I had to just push everything down. And then I, um, the week after, I remember, and I just sat crying out to God and asking him, I don't understand Sometimes it's okay to tell God that you don't understand. We don't always have to put on a face with God. We can go to him with our emotions. And I'm sure this lady had cried and prayed and cried out to God for help in this circumstance. And as I was praying and asking God to help me, I looked out my window and there was a big full arch rainbow right across the sky, right in front of our house. And God said, my promise still stands in spite of your circumstances. And I want to tell you that God's promise still stands in spite of your circumstances. And Hannah was born in the spring the following year. God kept his promise. God was faithful. And God always keeps his promises. If you have a promise from God today, raise your expectancy that God can do it in spite of how the circumstances look. Go to him today when you go home and recommit that promise to him and say, you promised me this and I'm going to stand with it and I'm going to expect you to follow through. Imagine if this woman had gone out and only got two or three pot jars for the oil to go into because she didn't really believe that God could do anything. It says that the oil stopped flowing when the vessels stopped. If she had only gathered two or three, the oil would have stopped at two or three. God pours into us based on our expectancy level of him, based on our faith level. God gives and gives and gives. Or imagine if she'd gone into her house and said, I'm too scared to try this. I don't think this will work. I'm going to do things my own way. But she did exactly as the prophet said, exactly as God had told her to do. And God did a miracle through her. We need to gain bold expectancy that God can add and will do what he says he will do. Are you missing out on the answer to your crisis because your expectancy level is so low? Go to God. Ask him to raise it today. Recommit that promise 
or that desire or that dream that you have within you to him and tell him that you'll go for it with him by your side and ask him to raise your expectancy in him. I had a close friend of mine um, die in October 2017. She was only 36 years old and um, she had got cancer in the March and she died in October and she was one of those friends do you know who you meet up with and she always has another idea of how to reach people for Jesus and every time we met for a coffee she had another idea and another idea and another idea and her ideas and ideas kept growing until she got hit with cancer and she died and I didn't understand what God was doing and I went to God and I prayed and then I went to her funeral and there were hundreds at her funeral it was in a church like this, and it was jam-packed inside, jam-packed outside, and out the halls behind it as well. There was people everywhere. And no matter who you spoke to, they said that she had impacted their life because they had met Jesus through her, or she had helped them develop more faith because of her faith in God. Her life wasn't very long, but it was well-lived because she had bold expectancy. She created space for God through privacy, and she had bold expectancy in what God could do through her. And God worked miracle after miracle in her world. She, he helped her reach people after people because she trusted in him. I pray that this has been a help to you, and I pray that if you need to sort some things out between you